The word of the cross, according to verse 25, doesn't just lift guilt from us. It reaches out to us and it brings us back from lostness and erring and straying. And doesn't just do that. It presents us to a shepherd and a guardian of our souls. When the word of the cross comes savingly to us, we find that we begin to love what God loves. In this episode of Light and Truth, John Piper opens 1 Peter 2, 21 to 25 and emphasizes the power of the cross to transform our desires. The sermon was originally preached at Bethlehem Baptist Church on June 26, 1994. The main thing that we see here is a word to us from God about the purpose of this church. And more importantly even than that, a word from the Lord about his unwavering, massive, eternally compelling commitment to see that purpose through even at the cost of the life of his son backed up by the warrant of the blood of the Son of the living God and therefore cannot fail. It's stated three times, this connection between the purpose of God for us and how we live as a church together horizontally and the warrant and the security and the endorsement and the power and the commitment behind that purpose in the cross, in the death of Jesus. Three times this is stated. Number one is found in verse 21. Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example in order that you might follow in his steps. Now, here are the two parts to that. Christ suffered for you. Purpose that you might follow in his steps. Now, there's the purpose of Bethlehem Baptist Church. We are to be a people who walk in the steps of Jesus. So where he walked, we walk. The way he walked, we walk. The way he talked, we talk. The way he loved, we love. The way he was firm, we're firm. We want to be a people like Jesus for this city and for each other. Now, the power and the, the warrant, commitment behind it to make that happen is Christ suffered for us. Okay? Now, that's what we're going to see three times. Christ suffered to make this happen. Christ suffered for us so that we might become like him. Don't, don't make a mistake in this verse. When it says he suffered for us to leave an example so that we'd walk, you might reduce the whole verse to imitation. And just say the meaning of the death was to present a model of loving sacrifice. So be like that. Well, well that's true. But that's not the whole truth, nor is it even the main truth theologically. The main truth is found in the little words, for us. You see that? He suffered for you. And if, if you miss that, you'll turn the whole cross into something just to be imitated instead of something that powerfully redeemed you, powerfully took your place, powerfully substituted God for you in the whole transaction of judgment. Don't miss the for us. It was in his dying and suffering for us that we are now enabled to be like him. If you leave that out, this will become law. Burden. Weight. But if you put the for you in there, then the key is inserted and you can unlock this purpose for our church. The next one is found in verse 24. First part of the verse. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross or on the tree. And here comes the purpose. 
that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Now, there's exactly the same structure of thought as verse 21, right? Verse 21 said, he suffered for us that we might walk in his steps. Verse 24 says, he bore our sin in his body that we might live to righteousness. I take living to righteousness and walking in his steps as synonymous. It's the same thing. If I walk in the steps of Jesus, I am dying to sin and living to righteousness. And if I live to righteousness, I'm following Jesus. And in both cases, the, the power behind it, the, God's commitment behind it, is certified in the death of his son. He suffered, verse 21. He bore our sins, verse 24. What Peter is doing here is bringing Isaiah 53 into our lives. Isaiah 53, 6, one of, the, one of the first verses I ever learned as a little boy went, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one of us to his own way. And the Lord, that's God the Father, has laid on him, that's God the Son, the iniquity of us all. Now that's what verse 24 here in our text is bringing up to date and into our lives. The Lord said 700 years before it happened, I'm going to take the sins of my people and lay them on my servant, my son, who now we know to be Jesus. Paul said it like this in 1 Corinthians 15. I remind you, brethren, in what terms I preach to you the gospel, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. So if you ever wonder, what does that mean? In accordance with the scriptures. It means in accordance with Isaiah 53, 6, along with a lot of other scriptures. But at least you can remember that one. Isaiah 53, 6, he laid on him the iniquity of us all, and that is the gospel. He laid on him the iniquity of us all. That is tremendously good news. I want to linger. I want to just linger here a minute. It is the only hope for our church in view of what we've been through together. It's the only hope that we have that Christ bore our sins. He bore my sins. He bore your sins. That's our only hope. And that's a powerful hope. I mean, just think of it. Think of what we are saying when we say that. Jesus is no ordinary person. He is the Son of the living God. And the Father willed it, and He willed it, and He took it. He carried it. And that has a very powerful implication among us. But if we could get a handle on this emotionally, that the guilt of those sins, our sins, was carried by the Son of God, lifted and taken off of us up onto the cross, we could, I believe, say we will leave the past with the Lord and we will move in the strength of that gift and that Atonement forward together. Do you believe this morning that your sins were carried by Jesus? That he bore in his body your sins? Do you believe that he bore the sins of those that you are most angry with for their sin? Do you believe that? The implications are tremendous for us. If we will, if we will, we can leave that with God. We can leave it. And that would be a refreshing thing for us. We can say, I trust you, Jesus, that all my sins, all the ones that are public, all the ones that are private, all of them are lifted, born, suffered for, removed, I bear them no more. I do not carry my guilt into the future. 
Oh, how I want you to be able to say that about your life. You don't have to go to bed guilty at night. You know, some people are night guilty people and some people are morning guilty people. No wonder what you are. I'm a morning guilty people. I feel the presence and power of God at night and I have to get saved in the morning. It's the way Satan works. It's the way my personality works. I don't know. But whichever it is, if you're a night guilty person or a morning guilty person, wherever you do your battle with your past and your inadequacies and your failures, you don't have to lose that battle. You don't have to go to bed guilty and you don't have to get out of bed guilty because 1 Peter 2.24 says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. And if you trust him, that his achievement is so great that you don't have to carry that into the future, it will make all the difference in the world in your life and in the life of this church. Let that sink in. Notice clearly again what the aim of this death of Jesus was, this sin-bearing, guilt-bearing death. He says it was in order that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. So the correspondence, as I pointed out, is the same with verse 21. There he suffered that we might walk in his footsteps. Here he bears our sin so that we might live to righteousness. In both cases you have, can I use a big word? Not to presume upon you, but to teach you. Vicarious or substitutionary. Those are precious words. I know they're not common coin in America, but the suffering of Jesus is a vicarious, substitutionary suffering for you. And the death of Jesus is a vicarious, substitutionary death for you. And the aim of both of those substitutionary, vicarious sufferings and dying is that we might walk in his steps and live to righteousness. Now, that's really important to see the purpose of this precious sin-bearing work. And I want to ask you a question. I'm going to do a little psychological analysis here. Does that sound like good news? That second point? I think there are a lot of people for whom the first is good news and the second is bad news. Here's what I mean. By the first, I mean the grace of the cross is its lifting of sin off of us and the guilt goes and the shame goes and you're pronounced and judged clean and justified. And then it feels, I think a lot of people exult in that and say, yes, that's the gospel to me. That's my only hope. That's the way I live. And then you move over to this second point of this message in this text where it says he did that in order that we might do something, namely walk in his steps and live unto righteousness. And it feels like the gospel and grace that was given with one hand is taken back with the other. Let's ask this question. Would it really be good news to you if you heard God say this morning, I hereby lift from everyone in this room the everlasting guilt of any sin you have ever done, ha are doing maybe right now, and will do. I lift it from you, and I will never take from you the power to keep you from sinning. Now, if that sounds like good news, you know what it means? It means you love sin and not God. If God comes to you and says, I'll take from you your guilt, I'll take from you your punishment, but I won't rescue you from the power and obsession with sinning. I won't do that. It isn't guaranteed in my cross, and I make it no promise. If that sounds like good news, oh good, because now I can live like the world and there'll be no punishment. It just documents where your heart is, right? 
And I, I fear that much of our sensing of the purpose of the cross in our righteousness as burden is because there are lurking love affairs with sin. And there are, in fact, in every one of us. And this text is teaching, and I want you to hear it as good news. This text is teaching that God commits himself with almighty love through the death of his son, not only to lift from you your guilt, but to take a lifetime, if necessary, to sever the power of sinning in your life. That's good news. Because I frankly am not content to be redeemed only from guilt. I want sin to be gone out of my life. I want temptation to hit me like a BB on a boxcar. I don't want any power of sin ruling over me. And so this text doubles my delight in the cross rather than diminishing it. He died that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. He commits himself to do that. But you might, you might be saying right now, are you sure that it's a commitment? Might it not? Might the cross not be just a an offer? Might the cross not just create for God's people a possibility that that would happen? Is it really a security and an achievement of the cross that that will most definitely happen? Well, let's go to statement number three, and I think there's an answer given to that question in the second part of verse 24 and 25. Quoting Isaiah 53 again, he says at the end of verse 24 there, by his wound, literally, his wounds, his dying wounds on the cross, you were healed. It does not say you were offered healing. It does not say that healing became a possibility. Something happened at the cross more decisive than the creation of an offer. An offer was created, oh yes. A possibility was created, oh yes. But something more happened at the cross than that. When he was wounded, his people were healed. It says that. And therefore, I won't settle for a view of the cross that simply says it holds out a possibility that you could make something of. More happened there. Than that. Here's another big theological word you can stick into your vocabulary this morning. The cross is therefore efficacious. It effects, it accomplishes, it achieves. There's power in the cross. There's power in the cross. God did something to his people through the cross. He didn't just create new possibilities, he creates thereby new people. Now, Peter is not thinking about physical healing here. I believe that because of the cross, all our diseases are going to be healed, either in this age or in the age to come. It's because he died that we will one day have new resurrection bodies, and therefore there is a real application of Isaiah 53. By his wounds or stripes, you are healed. That's not what Peter has in mind here. Peter has in mind a spiritual healing that is defined in the next verse, 25. It says... For, so by his wounds you are healed, for, here comes the explanation, you were continually straying like sheep. That was your problem, that was your sickness. You were erring, straying, self-destructing, ready to go over the cliff, in the briars, wolves everywhere. And you're a helpless sheep. You were straying like that. But now you have returned or you have been returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. What's the healing that was achieved for us by his wound? The healing is that we are brought back from a self-destructive, erring, straying way of life to a 
shepherd protector and a shepherd guide and a shepherd provider. Let me sum up these three statements and then let some light shine back on the first ones from the third one. The first one was in verse 21. Christ suffered so that we would walk in his footsteps. The second one was in verse 24. Christ died and bore our sins so that we would live to righteousness. Now, here's the third one. Christ was wounded so that we would be healed, defined as being brought back from self-destructive lostness into the green pastures of our good shepherd. Now, is that good news? Is verse 25 good news? The word of the cross, according to verse 25, doesn't just lift guilt from us, it reaches out to us and it brings us back from lostness and erring and straying and doesn't just do that, it presents us to a shepherd and a guardian of our souls. When the word of the cross penetrates the human heart, it, according to chapter 1, verse 23, does a thing called new birth. It opens us and awakens us to realize that we're lost and that our shepherd is back here, not out there. The pastures are back here, not out there. And this sheds light back onto something I was very perplexed by in verse 24. The thing that kept me longest in this sermon preparation was what does it mean that he bore our sins in order that we might die to sin? What does dying to sin mean? I think the answer is given in verse 25. And it goes like this. Verse 24 said, He bore our sin in His body that we might die to sin. Verse 25 says, He was wounded that I might be healed. And the healing is defined in terms of I was straying, erring in sin. And the word of the cross penetrates in and, and what does the word of cross now awaken me to? The word of the cross penetrates in, and what I see in the cross is the all-conquering love of God for me. That He did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for me. And now verse 25 begins to spell out what that means. He is bringing me back to a shepherd well, the shepherd gives me pastures and the shepherd gives me water and the shepherd protects me from the wolves and the shepherd won't let me get lost. And yes, sometimes he has to crack me over the back with his crook and bring me back. But I want a shepherd more than I want anything if I'm a sheep. And therefore, the cross, according to verse 25, is a an awakening to the reality that sin is a lie. Because sin was alluring me into straying by saying, you know, uh, I can protect you better than he can. And I can provide for you better than he can. And I won't ever hit you with a rod. I only give you pleasures. And on and on, sin lies and lies and lies and lies. And we are alive to that lie until we die to the lie by the word of the cross, crashing in on us with God's mighty shout, I love you and I bring you a shepherd care, a shepherd protection, a green pasture, flowing streams, eternal life, forgiven sins, a body of believers, an everlasting glory. It's a lie. And at that moment, I die to sin. You see the light being shed back from verse 25? This is, not, this is not burden. This is not law. This is homecoming to the shepherd and guardian of your soul. You are so happy to have this shepherd. He knows where all the green pasture is and all the water is. And he will lead you through the valley of the shadow of death and pursue you with goodness and mercy all of your life. This is Light and Truth. 
God-centered preaching to help you see Christ clearly and treasure Him truly. I'm your host, Dan Kruver. Thank you for listening. On our next episode, John Piper begins a three-part series titled, Keeping Eternity in View. I hope you'll join us. For more resources, visit DesiringGod.org.